All right, um, Jennifer, can you go to the next slide? All right, so good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us. My name is Sarah Husky with 3C Wren. I've started recording this course and it'll be posted on 3C Wren's on-demand page. Uh, we are here today to talk about the 2022 Energy Code, uh, which went into effect January 1st, is specifically about how the new code applies to accessory dwelling units or ADUs. Before we get going, I just have a few slides to run through. Uh, we ask that everyone make sure they're on mute throughout the duration of the course. Uh, we encourage you to participate and ask questions throughout the chat box. And it's uh, really helpful if uh, you can rename your name on your picture, uh, just helps kind of capture attendance uh, for our metrics. Next slide. So a little bit about us. We are the Tri-County Regional Energy Network, also known as 3C Bren. We are a collaborative partnership between San Luis Obispo, Santa Barbara, and Ventura counties, working to improve energy efficiency in our region by offering free programs and services for building professionals and households. 3C Ren is funded by ratepayer dollars, which is collected through the public goods charge found on our utility bills. Uh, 3C Ren offers three separate programs. Uh, the Energy Code, Co Energy Code Connect program serves building professionals by offering Title 24 support for everyone from plans examiners and inspectors to architects and contractors. This program also offers the Energy Code Coach service, which is an over the phone, online and in the field support for Title 24 questions for both residential and non-residential projects. And another program that we offer is the Building Performance Training, which serves building professionals uh, by offering technical and soft skill trainings relating to building science principles, high performance buildings, and communication techniques. And we have our home energy savings program, which incentivizes contractors and helps residents save money and make their homes healthier with energy efficient upgrades through incentives and rebates. Uh, you may see a few people on the course today with a 3C REN background. If you do, feel free to chat with them directly with any questions you may have. And with that, I will pass things over to Jennifer and Grant. Hi, everyone. Welcome. I'm Jennifer Rennick. Um, I'll be the lead presenter on this, and I'm a licensed architect and certified energy analysts and um, generally I very much enjoy the energy code. Don't don't ask me why. And I'm accompanied by Grant who's also uh, from our office and is a certified energy analyst. And he knows the code very well, but he doesn't pretend that he enjoys it as much as I do. <laughs> He's more stealth. <laughs> So Grant, jump in um, on this when we come to certain slides or topics that you know have shown up in our Code Coach questions. Thanks, Jennifer, and I'll be monitoring the chat and uh, integrating anyone's questions into the presentation. Perfect, that's right. So please feel free to use the chat for your questions because that is why Grant is here. And we do have um, learning units available through the AIA and ICC for this course. Contact or reach out to Sarah if you um, weren't able to include your number in the registration. This is part of a series of 2022 code updates that we are presenting, and we're in the third part of our series. Last time we covered single family and existing uh, additions and alterations, and I believe we'll be presenting those again, or they'll be available on 3C REN website. And then next time we'll be going over the multifamily projects. We have a course coming up in May for residential and non-residential Cal Green, and also the non-residential code. 
We're going to start by reviewing a few basic things with the energy code and its triennial cycle, how um, it's been reorganized a little bit, just as a highlight of one of the major changes from 2019 to the 2022 energy code. And then we'll delve into ADU's accessory dwelling unit, specifically a little bit about the benefits and the kind of types of ADUs, and then how the 2022 energy code has been updated and some of the key highlights that would affect your ADU projects. As a reminder, the California Energy Commission um, has energy building energy efficiency standards that they regulate, and that is in a three year process. So every three years, the CEC goes through a vetting process and a cost effectiveness study with in house experts industry experts and other stakeholders and public engagement, and they update the energy code. So California is on its way to having extremely energy efficient buildings. And the big picture goal is to reduce California's greenhouse gas emissions. And they're doing that in the 2022 code by encouraging heat pump technology for space heating and water heating, also includes space cooling. Um, they're establishing electric ready requirements for single family and multifamily projects of new construction. They're expanding the PV system requirements and also including battery storage ready standards for new construction. And in general, they're strengthening the indoor air quality ventilation standards, both for new addition and alterations. We're gonna focus on our Tri-County Regional Energy Network, rather the Tri-County Regional Areas, which includes Santa Barbara County, Ventura County, and San Luis Obispo County. So climate zones four, five, six, nine, and 16, generally speaking. Um, most of the examples we'll give you are, are pretty much gonna be hitting on climate zones four, five, and six, because that's the bulk of our tri-county regional area. The code for the 2022 building uh, energy code went into effect January 1st, 2023. So now all projects uh, permitted and apply for permit after January 1st are gonna fall under this 2022 code. And you can get a lot more information on the code specifics uh, through the CEC website, energy.ca.gov. Also, you can get access and links to the energy code through 3C REN's website. If you have any questions about the code, remember that we do have a code coach service and it's called Energy Code Connect. And you can contact us and you'll most likely get Grant and a few others through our 3C REN website. Okay, the energy code has been updated from 2019 to 2022. It's been reorganized. The main difference between how we were looking up things in the 2019 energy code and now compared to the 2022 code is that we would have a section for all buildings. We had a big portion of the code specifically for high-rise residential, non-residential, and hotel motel sections. And then we had low-rise residential sections. Now, under the 2022 code, 
We've, faced, we've taken the multifamily buildings out of the hotel, motel, non-residential sections and taken it out of the res, low-rise residential sections and creating their own section of, for multifamily buildings. Another way of looking at that and the way the whole uh, energy code is organized is we basically had low rise residential chapters and then everything else that was not low rise residential chapters. And now under the new code, we still have, you know, our big picture which covers the scope and all the definitions, mandatory requirements for all occupancies. But now we have just the single family residential section. We now have a new multifamily residential section. And then we have everything that's not residential. Today, most of the ADUs are gonna fall under the single family residential sections of the code, but ADUs do also apply to multifamily residential occupancies. And there's a couple different ways that you can have your ADUs, your accessory dwelling units show compliance under the energy code. And in that you've got, we're gonna address a performance method and a prescriptive method. But in general, the big picture high level changes for this new code is we're gonna have new space conditioning requirements. There's been some lighting upgrades. There's something called uh, electric ready and electric battery ready. And we have some new uh, exceptions on PV system requirements. Today, we're going to hit on just a few of these that are the most pertinent to ADUs. And we encourage you to look at the other classes for the single family and additions and alteration changes to go in a bit more detail on each of those categories. The 2022 code is paving the way for all electric construction. And the reason I'm mentioning this for ADUs is because a lot of jurisdictions are now adopting uh, REACH codes where they're encouraging or incentivizing all electric systems, or in some case, limiting the ability to install new gas infrastructure in new construction. So that is jurisdiction dependent. So you'll have to find out what your local jurisdiction is uh, requiring. Nonetheless, going all electric for ADUs can make the construction of your ADU a lot more cost effective. Uh, you don't have to deal with combustion within the building and you can eliminate uh, gas lines, which you can use to offset other costs. And now we've got heating systems and water heating systems that um, are using heat pump technology. So they're a lot more efficient than electric resistance. We now have induction cooktops and convection ovens that are available in uh, kind of the builder's budget uh, model. We've got condensing heat pump clothes dryers that don't require the same amount of venting and are um, very energy efficient. And one thing the California Energy Commission has shown us is that an all electric home reduces the carbon, the CO2 footprint by 66% compared to a 2019 code compliant home with mixed fuel. And that's kind of the average, their study that they did. Now that reduction in footprint by going all electric is, uh, we're able to do that in a lot of areas in California now because California as a whole has so many renewable energy resources like solar and wind and large hydro that still is 
in operation that tips that turning point. So going all electric now it can result in a smaller carbon footprint. So the energy code, quick review, it's in general, the energy code is comprised of three kind of terms, three sections that you need to be aware of. One, we're going to talk about mandatory measures, and those are required for all the projects. Then we're going to mention prescriptive component package or prescriptive measures. When we mention that, it means that if you follow the prescriptive method of showing compliance, it's like a recipe card or a checklist. You you have to do all the parts of the prescriptive method. And then performance method is another way of saying computer modeling or computer approach or energy modeling approach. And this allows for trade-offs. And by far, we see that this is the most common way to show performance, I mean, to show compliance with new construction. But I'm, I'm finding, and I'll point it out later, that with some ADUs, it's a little bit easier to go with the prescriptive. Under the performance method, key change to 2022 is that for new construction, so your standalone brand new ADUs, new construction, there's going to be two metrics that you have to show compliance with. And one is essentially a proxy for carbon. It's called an EDR1 or energy design rating number one. Now for the ADUs, and junior ADUs that are additions and alterations to an existing building. We still are going to show compliance in terms of TDV, which means time dependent valuation. It's now being called an EDR2. So, in other words, if you have a building and you are looking at just what you read on your meter, just the utility bill you pay, that's known as, as site energy. Okay, that's fine. The code specifically looks at source energy, which is now a proxy for carbon, which includes how that energy was made. And that's for new construction. And it still includes the TDV, which was a time dependent valuation a metric that really was based on a time of use and sort of the cost of making that energy. And that is the only metric that you'll need for your um, additions, alterations component that's also part of the ADUs. So when you get your new compliance form, you're gonna see an EDR1 and an EDR2. And if you see zeros in the EDR1 column, that is an indication that this is an addition alteration project. And the zero essentially means that the, that, that EDR1 is not applicable. And as long as you end up with a positive value on your compliance total, you're under the EDR2 in this case, your building, your addition, your alteration passes. Okay, before we get into the ADUs themselves, um, Bill, uh, Grant, anyone jump in if there's any questions. And otherwise, we kind of got through that beginning part of the code. And now I think we get more into the fun stuff. So accessory dwelling units um, have been really important in moving California towards having more affordable housing. And one, one benefit of accessory dwelling units is that you don't have to purchase new land, you don't necessarily have to include any new major infrastructure. 
course, you can have a greater family and community connection by having your extended family live there, uh, or you can set up a rental situation that includes essential workers or other people who don't need a large place to live. There's flexible living arrangements where a lot of people want to be able to age in place or their family would like to have a home health care person available but give them great privacy and an ADU can afford that and then a lot of other people are finding that an ADU can be a great source of rental income. Now we call them accessory dwelling units meaning accessory as a secondary dwelling unit secondary to the primary dwelling unit. Um, a lot of folks will refer to the ADUs as in-law units or granny units or secondary units. They're all referring to the same, same um, type of construct or same building type. This is a great resource for ADUs, the Accessory Dwelling Unit Handbook. So this was updated in July, 2022. You can get access to it through the Housing and Community Development, you know, Department of Cal or California Department of Housing Community and Development's website. So hcd.ca.gov. And this handbook is great for homeowners as well as architects and planning and building departments. They've updated a lot of the questions um, and answer section, including a now including a section that specifically directs folks to the California Energy Commission and Title 24 code requirements and how the code looks at accessory dwelling units. There's basically two types, you know, of accessory dwelling units that we're going to talk about. One is just, it's called ADU, accessory dwelling unit, and the other is a junior ADU or JADU. So an ADU itself is defined as a complete independent living facility. So it can be for one or more people. You have to have permanent provisions for living, sleeping, eating, cooking, and sanitation. And the kitchen needs to have a cooking facility with appliances and reasonably sized food prep counter and storage. It's got to have an independent bathroom facility and must have a heating and cooling system that does not share air with another dwelling unit. And in that case, it would also have its own thermostat. So it's independently controlled. So this example and this ADU, um, we have a, a compact kitchen on the right hand side that does have a cooktop and a refrigerator. We've got a a full bathroom facility behind that refrigerator area, and then a small ducted, concealed ducted mini split with a wall thermostat. And you can see the um, you can see the grills right above the closet door that heats and cools that ADU. Junior ADUs are similar. Um, however, they, in order to be considered a junior ADU, it must be with created within the walls of that primary residence. So it could be a conversion or an alteration that took place within the primary walls of an existing residence. It can't be more than 500 square feet in size. Or if you're applying for permit for a brand new home, a new single family home, you could include within that uh, structure, a junior ADU. So it could be part of new construction or a junior ADU could be part of additions and alterations. 
Um, what differentiates the junior ADU is that it can include separate or shared uh, sanitation or bathroom facilities. In this case, um, in this particular example, there is a, a bathroom that's uh, to the right-hand side. And it may share with the central heating and cooling system with the main house, but it does have to have an efficiency kitchen, meaning it's got to have a cooking facility with uh, appliances and reasonably sized food prep counter and storage. It needs to have a door to the exterior, but it could also have an interior access door to the main house. Now, when it comes to ADUs and junior ADU types, we'll see that planning and building departments have adopted a lot of these diagrams uh, the middle one I grabbed from the city of Stockton, the other ones I grabbed from the city of St. Paul. There's, it's pretty common to see allowable ADUs and junior ADUs described this way in, from planning and building departments and when we're talking about housing regulations. And so um, a detached new construction ADU is often referred to as a detached ADU and an attached or sometimes internal ADU is referred to as an ADU or junior ADU that might be incorporated into an attic or a basement or another existing portion of the home. Um, a conversion, it's also detached, but a conversion is taking an existing structure and modifying the existing structure to become an ADU. And then of course you can have an attached ADU that's just an addition to the house like you would think of as a normal addition. Now, in the language of the energy code, however, your detached, New construction is just considered new construction. And this is the part of the code that would be, everything would apply to this structure, including PVs, including battery ready, electric ready, et cetera. If you have an attached, sometimes called an internal or detached, sometimes just called a conversion or an attached addition, all of those under the California Energy Code would be addressed under alterations and additions. And another way of thinking about this is that the new construction ADUs or a home that includes a new, that in, includes a junior ADU, it's all new construction. This section 150.1 .1 is applicable, includes the electric ready, battery ready, PVs, walls, et cetera. And you're gonna get a copy of the slide, so I'm not gonna go through this in detail, but the thinking was that something like this could give you a quick reminder or look on which sections to go to for what you're doing and your ADUs that are conversions, and they could be attached or detached, but if they're a conversion, they're considered an addition. And you would go to the section 150.2A for additions. And alterations would include those ADUs and the junior ADUs that are within an existing conditioned residence. And for those, you'd go to section 150.2, alterations. And I've got to tell you that if you didn't listen to our, or if you're not that familiar with the code, the additions are fairly straightforward, but the alterations are nuanced. So if your project is truly an alteration, you're going to want to go into that part of the code and uh, or work with your energy consultant to make sure you get um, 
those requirements put in place because some of them can be a little uh, surprising. So DTAG, oh yeah, go ahead. Jennifer, we yes. had a question from John Williams or a comment. Um, he stated that there are restrictions regarding the JADU's efficiency kitchen. Are you familiar with the term efficiency kitchen regarding the JADU? Yes. So efficiency, um, it, it efficiency kitchen. There's actually a great little uh, blog or kind of article on 3C Ren website that you could go to for efficiency kitchen. Um, Sarah, I don't know if you have the link to that. You could send them, but efficiency kitchen means that it has to have a cooking appliance. It has to have reasonable amount of countertop for food preparation and food storage. So that usually, you know, so that food storage is going to imply a small refrigerator, but you could have a big refrigerator, a reasonable countertop it's reasonable relative to the size of the adu itself so if you have a small adu or small junior adu you may have a relatively small amount of countertop but it needs to be functional but it can be very compact but it does need to include cooking facilities I, you mentioned I it also needs to be limited to 120 volt electric appliances. Yes. Yes. Thanks, John. For the standalone brand new construction under the energy code, it's just new construction. And that means that it's attached because it's new construction, nothing existed there before, or if something was there, you demolished it to make way for this new construction project. And these could be relatively small, but it, it can also have one or two bedrooms. It really depends on the property and the existing residence, but that's something that you would work out with your planning department on the size of the ADU. But from the energy code perspective, it's a new construction, low rise residential building. So it's gonna include all the measures for your walls, roof, floor, windows, and their uh, insulation levels. It's gonna include all the ventilation requirements for indoor air quality. You have to meet all your mechanical heating, cooling, domestic hot water, and you're going to comply with all the components of what's called electric ready and battery storage ready. And there's going to be PV solar panels that potentially are required unless you uh, meet one of the exemptions. For a ventilation and indoor air quality, you, you still have to meet your kitchen and bathroom exhaust. And under the new code, just as a quick highlight, there are some new requirements for the kitchen exhaust. There's some new requirements for your duct sizing. Um, there's new language for balanced ventilation and heat recovery and new requirements for testing the airflow of some of these ventilation systems and the kitchen exhaust system. It's been updated but a lot of these things haven't changed much. Now, when it comes to ADUs and the size of the structure, you might end up um, meeting some of the exemptions. But we'll uh, kind of touch on that a little bit further in the presentation. The probably one of the biggest changes you're gonna deal with is now what's called electric ready requirements. And the electric ready requirements means that if you actually end up installing uh, propane or natural gas appliances, 
you would have to also include the electric infrastructure to allow for the easy replacement of those appliances with electric appliances, heat pump appliances, if it's a water heater, uh, heat pump, if it's a furnace you're replacing, um, an electric cooktop, it could be induction, it could be uh, electric range and dryers. And those could be electric or condensing dryers. But the main thing is you would have to set up your panel and set up the circuitry for the um, future adoption of electric appliances. I think this is one reason why a lot of folks, especially with a small ADU project, are just choosing to install the electric from the get-go if it's problematic and not cost-effective to run gas out to a new ADU. Now, when it comes to energy storage systems, ESS or AKA battery ready, even the ADUs are required to be battery ready. And what this means is that you would have a 225 amp main electrical panel. And as opposed to a 200 amp panel, which is the current code. So the panel amperage has gone up and that's because so many projects, so many homes now are moving towards all electric, but also a lot of people are choosing to get electric vehicles and they wanna have some electric charging available and they may have solar panels installed with their project, depending on the size. You would also need a sub panel or some way of designating that you have a dedicated circuitry for, for branch circuits and they need to be identified. And one of those needs to go to a refrigerator. At least one needs to go to a lighting circuit near a primary egress. And at least one would go to a sleeping room or sleeping area with a receptacle outlet. And then a fourth one that could that could um, be another receptacle or other other lights or something some other appliance. I think um, Grant, we've had some really kind of interesting questions on the solar or sorry the energy storage system. Ready? Do you want anything you want to add to that? Um. No, um, people are still just working out the 225 versus the other 200 requirements you'll find in other places. So this 225 is is a change in a new requirement. Um, I did want to pause you real quick because we have a little bit of conversation going about the efficiency kitchen still. Okay. Um, so just a little more clarification on that. Um, John mentioned that JADUs cannot have gas appliances for the efficiency kitchen. And then we had a question asking if any newly built ADU has to be all electric. So if you don't mind just rehitting the efficiency kitchen and then when we're allowed to have gas or not allowed to have gas if there's less examples. Okay, so some of the, yeah, that's a good question. Now, the <laughs> energy code, the energy code does not explicitly dictate whether you have gas or electric in your efficiency kitchen. So it's going to be, um, that requirement's going to be specific to what um, the housing of community development and housing is saying is the definition of a junior ADU and what requirements your local jurisdiction may have. So for some jurisdictions, I know that they are really promoting and pushing for all electric construction when something is new. 
So you've got that. And with, I can tell you just from a real practical point of view, and we're going to hit on a small diagram coming up, um, the new energy code specifically dictates the size of hood or kitchen ventilation for that cooking appliance, whether it's gas or electric, and based on the square footage of the dwelling. So without having the part that part of the ADU junior ADU code memorized, I can tell you from a very practical perspective that when you go with a gas appliance in a very small space, you would be required to have a CFM of like 260 or so, which would be very high for a small efficiency kitchen. So it only makes sense to me that only all electric would be required, but I don't have that memorized. <laughs> Great. Sarah and Grant, I, I'm depending on you guys to do a quick um, a quick search. But the the three but three C Ren's website has a quick link to it, and that handbook that um, you could get. You'll get a copy of the slides, but you could go to that handbook, and those are some of the commonly asked questions, and they also address all those requirements and difference between the junior ADU and the ADU. And the only other part of the requirement that I would say some people get hung up on is what is considered a reasonably sized food preparation area. And that's where you have to just um, really look at the whole size of the, the unit. You know, if, you're, if it's only um, 400 square foot, maybe you don't need 15 feet of countertop you know so you gotta make it reasonable maybe three foot is plenty it just depends okay um let's see back i hope i answered the questions uh back back to the solar voltaic so solar photovoltaic requirements again this is for new construction standalone new construction the actual um, prescriptive formula you can use for kind of a rule of thumb for sizing, if you're doing the prescriptive method, you absolutely would follow this formula and this would be how you do it. But if you're going to show compliance for your ADU with a performance method, the computer modeling method, then this formula is handy for a very close approximation. But the um, actual computer method uses uh, PV watts, another algorithm running in the background. And so that's what you'll be required to do, what shows up in that computer program. And then this prescriptive formula is a very close approximation to what PV watts will calculate for you. And it's based on climate zone and it's based on the size of the conditioned floor area of your dwelling unit. Now, it's important to realize that for ADUs, a PV system is not required when that kilowatt PV size is less than 1.8 kilowatts. And as an example, if you were building an ADU in climate zone six, and it was a thousand square feet of conditioned floor area, that kilowatt system would be 1.82. So 1.82 is greater than 1.80. PV system is required. And in this case, if you were to use a residential, you know, residential system, um, maybe a 300 watt panel, you would need six panels. So, and those six panels could be on the ADU or they could actually go on the primary residence or they could even be mounted to a sh shade structure. Um, you may not have to do a PV system. Also, if your available roof area is less than 80 square feet. 
And you can reduce that PV size by 25% if you include a battery with a usable capacity of seven and a half kilowatt hours. Now, I have fielded a question about, well, what size ADU for each climate zone can I build without triggering the PV system? And so if your ADU was only 900 square feet in climate zone six, you wouldn't be required to install a PV system. If you're 950 square feet, you're just on the borderline, you may or may not need it. It depends on if you're using the performance method and what other trade-offs you have in that project. When it comes to conversions or additions, or sometimes also called internal um, ADUs, all of those are considered additions under the energy code. So you could have a straight up addition where the addition itself is new to you, but it's attached to your existing house. So it's an addition. You could also have an addition that takes an existing garage and it's converted to an ADU. That's also considered an addition under the energy code. And you could have an existing structure such as a garage, such as a shop that was already on the property and now you're going to convert that to an ADU, and that is also considered an addition. Now, when it comes to the junior ADUs, because um, the conversion of an attached garage can also be an, a junior ADU, as long as it's less than 500 square feet, and it is within the walls of the existing structure, in this case, that type of um, situation is also considered an addition. So when you have the ADU additions, you need to comply with the envelope, your ventilation, mechanical heating and cooling, and domestic hot water. As a reminder that ADU cannot share the return air with the primary dwelling. So you have to have a separate mechanical heating and cooling system. Now, it's a little nuanced in what we do with the envelope. There's something called a wall extension exemption. So in other words, if you've got a wall for that new ADU that's in alignment with an existing residential wall, it's possible that you don't have to um, increase the wall thickness from the existing residence. You get an exception for that one portion of the ADU that's considered a wall ex extension, but all the other walls presumably would need to comply with the current energy code. And it's partly because of this situation that I think Grant and I see a lot of ADUs or additions wanting to be run or the owners or builders want to run them as a computer model to see if they can get away with using smaller or skinnier two by four walls or only two by six walls without continuous exterior insulation, which is part of the new code. So what that can look like, and again, I'm giving you a copy of the slide, so I'm not, I don't want to have to read each of the code sections to you, but I'm trying to highlight for you what sections these are so you can readily find them when it comes to your project and the unique situation you may have for your project. And one way to think about this, and this is a, image from the California Energy Commission's blueprint. And the way they illustrated this is you have a wall extension when this new wall is in alignment with an old wall. And 
in this case, in this example, if your existing wall is a two by four construction, your extended wall can also be a two by four extension and you would fill the cavity with R15 insulation and you're done. You don't have to try and clad the outside of that wall or inside with continuous exterior interior rigid insulation. Now, if there's a jog in the wall so that it's not in straight alignment, then that new wall would have to meet the new code requirement and continuous exterior insulation is required prescriptively, which is also your baseline. And in this case, it could be a cavity filled um, two by six wall with a continuous R5 insulation. The code, um, for those of you who want to see what that looks like in terms of the prescriptive tables, I clipped this excerpt for, from it. And for climate zone five and six, we come down to the framed wall areas. You can see that the requirement is listed as a U value. So, okay, what does that mean? It's hard to know if you still have to use exterior insulation or know what size wall assembly that is and how much insulation is in there. So I included this other slide. It's kind of a little cheat cheat for y'all. And for climate zones six and seven, that wall could be a two by four wall with R15 cavity filled and an R4 continuous exterior insulation. But for climate zones one through five and eight through 16, which covers, you know, San Luis Obispo, Atascadero, where I'm, where I am, we would need to go with a two by six wall with an R21 cavity filled and an R5 continuous exterior insulation. Now, as a reminder, if you do the computer model method, you can trade some of these off for other efficiency measures. But I, I, but it's a little bit tricky, the smaller the project gets, in my opinion. Yeah, Grant Shane nodding, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, we have a couple of questions going backwards again. Um, I thought I'd take a moment real quick. Um, one is about the electrical panel. Uh, yeah. It's funny, we've been talking about this with local jurisdictions as well. We have two questions. One, uh, are you required to have a separate electrical panel? And the second one being, do you require to have a separate 225 panel for the new detached ADU? Or do you have the option to update the existing main electrical at the existing house to 400 and use it for the house and the new detached ADU? Um, do you have a straightforward answer or um, is this something that we're still figuring out how jurisdictions are handling yeah this well both because mm -hmm. this did come up for a project that i'm familiar with and they did upgrade the panel 400 for the whole project but they still had to have a sub panel that met all the requirements of battery ready, dedicated circuits. They had to still meet all the requirements for the new ADU because it was new construction. So at that point, I honestly don't know the nuance of that. Of I think you get involved with PG&E or SoCal Edison and your jurisdiction, but the energy code perspective is you, you have to make it ready for folks to be able to add those electric appliances, battery for resiliency, and and EV charging, et cetera. It's future proofing because one way of looking at it is your new construction today is the next person's remodel. And they're trying to remove all the cost prohibitive barriers that are stopping folks from adopting 
frankly, better technology and more energy efficient technology and a cleaner um, technology. Yeah, uh, one of the biggest designations that keeps coming up is the new detached by I know it's an ADU in all other areas, but by energy code that new construction detached ADU is just seen as a new construction residential building. So energy code wants to see its own dedicated new panel um, because it's not considered an ADU by energy code. Um, when you start talking about a detached ADU that was a garage, now it gets a little more gray. Um, Jennifer, there right. was a follow up on the- But it's- Go ahead. Uh, it's only gray because um, from the energy code perspective, there's no gray area because right. if it's already an existing structure, like uh, this example here, even though I'm specifically still talking about, you know, these wall exemptions, it's considered an addition and additions, alterations, none of those requirements apply. Um. We had a question about the PV equation. Yeah. It was the number is, is the number of dwellings newly built or what is sharing the electrical meter? So if you have an existing house and you add an ADU, would you count one or two dwellings? No, the, uh, again, if it's just nothing was there before and you now have a new building, so Planning department might call it an ADU, housing, uh, community development, housing might call it ADU. Energy code, it's like, oh, you're just building a new little house. So that new little house is one dwelling in it. Um, if you were, if this were part of a multifamily, see that same formula is used for multifamily projects and it can be used for a duplex. So that's why they specify, you know, how many dwelling units in the formula, because you might be working on a brand new duplex or you might be working on a multifamily project with many dwelling units. I have one more, then I'll let you continue. Okay. Um, where does an addition over an existing garage fall into the classification? Uh, it is just like it's an addition and the wall extension exemption could also apply in the vertical direction. Thanks. Uh, yeah, keep going. Well, I'm keeping track of these questions. So a lot of these will hit at the end of the, end of the presentation as well. Okay. And because uh, these walls are existing on these attached or detached conversions, which are considered additions under the energy code. Um, they're existing walls. There is a, there is a wall exemption allowed. So this is good to know because if you are doing a conversion, you're going to want to go into the section 150.2 that deals specifically with the envelope and as long as you are keeping all of your siding intact and you're only remodeling sort of from the inside you can keep your walls as is and you just fill those walls with as much insulation as you can so a two by four would have an r15 cavity fill and a two by six would have an r21 cavity fill and you're not required to collab those walls in exterior rigid insulation because they are considered existing and this is considered an addition. So this is really to help also cost effectiveness. The ADUs are something the state would like to see for improved housing and the state also realizes that it's completely not cost effective if you have to basically rebuild everything for this existing structure, they get that. So you, they just want you to fill those walls with good insulation and keep the siding intact. Uh, for junior ADUs, and it could also be an ADU, 
where you're doing this within the walls of an existing residence. So this could be where you see like a bonus room that's converted to a junior ADU, or um, you could have a conversion of a garage or an attic or a basement that's all within that existing structure. Then there are some other exemptions that apply where for example, if you do modify some of the walls during the midst of like bringing in your efficiency kitchen, for example, or updating a bathroom to accommodate everybody, uh, it has existing two by four walls. You just need to fill it with an R11 insulation or greater. It's really um, forgiving in that sense. Indoor air quality ventilation still does need to be met for these additions and alterations. And the indoor air quality, it's a mandatory measure. All projects have to have good indoor air quality. However, under the additions alterations section, um, it's nuanced on which part of these mandatory measures are required. I put the code language in here for you as a resource, but basically translation is that you need to follow what's called ASHRAE 62.2. Um, you could follow a formula or you can use the computer modeling method that will determine the amount of indoor fresh outside air that you need to be introduced indoors. And this could be done through uh, supply and exhaust fan. It could be used just a supply fan or just an exhaust fan. We happen to be a big fan of balanced ventilation, especially if you're working on multifamily projects, because if you don't use a balanced ventilation method with a multifamily project, you will have to comply with a dwelling unit air pressure boundary sealing and acceptance testing. And so for the multifamily stuff, I, I mentioned this because if you're working on a multifamily ADU, it's a lot more straightforward to go with these kind of off the shelf, readily available balanced ventilation um, systems. For your additions and indoor air quality ventilation, and actually for new construction as well, I mentioned that there's requirements for the kitchen appliance, your cooking appliance, and exhaust hoods. Um, there's two things to know. The Indoor air quality ventilation on an addition of a thousand square feet or less, it doesn't trigger. So it's fairly, fairly forgiving. If you're doing an addition to your existing structure, you don't have to now upgrade the indoor air quality ventilation, but you may want to but you don't have to for additions of a thousand square feet or less. And you don't have to if you're doing a junior accessory dwelling unit, which automatically by definition is, is an addition or an alteration in the existing building. But again, you might want to. For your local mechanical exhaust, meaning kitchens, bathrooms, etc., you do have to comply with that. So you do have to provide an exhaust fan in the bathrooms that meet Cal Green, et cetera, et cetera. And for your kitchens, you do have to have a hood or a system that exhausts to the outside based on whether your range or uh, cooktop is electric or gas. And assuming that we've got a 
junior ADU or an ADU that's going all electric and we have an electric range, the requirement for dwellings less than 750 square feet is 160 CFM fan or a 65% hood capture efficiency. And this diagram just shows the idea is that at least 65% per rating, uh, the hood is rated with a CE rating, that 65% of all that is gonna go to the outdoors and only 35% of it would be in the uh, dwelling unit or you need 160 CFM fan. And there's some other requirements that go along with it, uh, including um, some prescriptive ducting uh, requirements and uh, field testing. For ventilation cooling, so you've got ADU that um, is functioning, you know, on its own, by its own, whether it's an addition or not. Um, so those new dwelling units, oh, sorry, new dwelling unit detached. If it's less than 500 square feet, you don't have to comply with ventilation cooling and ventilation cooling is only going to kick in for those of you who are working in like say climate zone 9 or climate zone 16 where normally this is a requirement this is different than your indoor air quality fans this is a fan that usually ducks to the attic and you turn it on when the outdoor temperature temperature has cooled you open up your doors and windows and you turn that fan on so it exhausts all the hot air out of your house and pulls in cool, natural, you know, passive cooling and helps cool down your house without the need to run an air conditioner. Okay. And this is typically a prescriptive requirement or is the baseline in under the computer model. So this still would kick in for ADUs larger than 500 square feet. When it comes to space heating systems, either new or replacement space heating system serving in addition, it may be a heat pump or it could be a gas heating system. But keep in mind for both um, junior ADUs and attached ADUs, it may just be really simple, straightforward to install a one-to-one -one heat pump with a programmable thermostat. So in other words, you might already have your uh, heat pump or air conditioner and furnace system set up in the primary residence, but you might want some localized heat or controllable heat in your new ADU or in the junior ADU. And you can easily install a heat pump where you mount your outdoor condensing unit and they run refrigerant line to a new ductless indoor wall mounted unit, new thermostat, and you're done. It's a super cost effective way to get heating into those projects and it meets uh, code. For an example of this, um, See down at the bottom photo, they're, they're able to set. This is a, a larger system. This serves three indoor units to this one outdoor uh, condensing unit. But there's even with these larger ones and with the smaller ones, you can wall mount them or you can even mount them on a fiberglass tray that is set into the ground. It's really straightforward. And in this case, there was a raised floor situation. So they just ran that refrigerant line uh, through a new hole that was uh, sealed and then ran the refrigerant line under the floor and then up the outside wall for the new indoor unit. And again, ADUs may not share the return air with the primary dwelling unit through the heating and cooling system. So it really needs to be independent of whatever you have going on in the primary uh, system. And it needs to have its own thermostat. This is what this can look like. 
uh, we worked on one project where they took an existing home and created the junior ADU within that home. Um, and then later down the road, they decided that they would just do a full ADU and primary residence and just keep them separate. So it essentially turned it into a duplex. And the way they were able to do that is they took each of those ADUs and they would gave them their own compact ducted fan coil units. And those were in the attic and then it just ducted each each uh, part of that duplex essentially had its own return, its own supply, and its own thermostat. You can also run uh, wall-mounted uh, units for spot heating and cooling if you if you want. For new construction, as well as the additions that are adding a second water heater. There's really been no change in the code in that you can do it with a 240 volt heat pump water heater that's NIA tier three or higher, which means it can be a split system heat pump, which an outdoor condensing unit, indoor tank, water goes back and forth between the two. The outdoor unit contains all the refrigerant and the does all the heating of the hot water. And you can also use an integrated heat pump. In other words, that the heat pump is on top of the tank of water. These are allowable, um, but for very small residences, the integrated heat pump type might not be the answer because it kicks off cold, uh, dry air. Great for the summer, but it may not be very helpful at all in the winter. So you might need to duct it or look at other options. You can still, depending on your jurisdiction, per the energy code, you're allowed to just use a gas on demand unit, but you do need to bring in gas line and you've got to duct it, all the flue gas to the outside. So these are kind of the main options. However, new to the code, which is really cool, is that if you have a small dwelling unit that is one bedroom or less, like a studio, you can use a 120 volt heat pump water heater that plugs in. And uh, last July, Ream just started to offer their plug-in version. So that helps simplify a lot for the uh, small residences and you can still uh, get a duct kit and duct the cold air outdoors if you don't want it inside your unit. And then for new additions and dwelling units that are 500 square feet or less, prescriptively you're allowed to use an instantaneous electric water heater with point of use distribution. So this is a major change uh, from the 2019 code, really taking into account the ADU market and the need for ADUs. Now, what I, we have found, what I've found so far is that um, when I have taken those ADUs and run them under the performance method, it's tricky to get this electric on-demand water heater to work if the clients are also trying to mitigate away from having continuous exterior wall insulation. Like you're not gonna get both is what I found. There's no way to do the trade-off on the walls by choosing an electric um, resistance water heater. So, my thinking, my advice was, if you have to do that wall insulation anyway, and you want to go with the electric resistance, I would just comply prescriptively with that ADU. It's less than 500 square feet. 
it's not going to be super cost prohibitive to have better wall assemblies and be done with it. That's not personally how I would treat it. Now, if you do go this route, it's important to understand that the point of use means that your appliance has to be within a certain distance of your shower and your sink faucet. Now, this is uh, sort of approved by a plans examiner by looking at the location, but in the field, in order to actually comply with this requirement in the field, you do have to take a look at table 4.4.5 and the joint appendices, um, and it tells you what your length of piping can be per the nominal size of the diameter. So there is a line size versus length for each run. And there are some other considerations and that has to do with your electric panel size and breakers and have a way to flush out uh, filter and cleaning. Now, of course, if it's standalone new construction and you're looking at this, you've got, um, you know, you're already, we've talked about the electric panel quite a bit. You're not going to have any trouble fitting this, but if it's an addition and you're, you may have to upgrade your electric panel if you go this route. Okay. And then the other thing, how this point of use works is that usually the appliance has three quarters inch line connection, typical. And you might notice on the chart that only gives you a five foot length run. So what you're going to want to do is connect to that three quarters inch line, but very quickly manifold it down so that you would have, you know, half inch line running to the shower. So if you could do that within five feet, that gives you another seven to eight feet that you could run your three eighths inch. Uh, line to your sink faucet. And then presumably your little efficiency kitchen would be like on the back side of that sink to save to save run length. Okay, we just went through a lot of material and we are open to questions. And I can go back to any slides if we need to, but I think kind of super important is if you are working on ADUs that you get a hold of the updated um, handbook and really take a look at those definitions. And if you're an architect, a builder, plans examiner side of it, just kind of keep in mind that the way the energy code talks about ADUs is it's either just a new construction and energy code doesn't really care if you call it an ADU or what you call it. It's just a new little house to the energy code or it's pretty much everything else, which would be either addition an alteration or a combination of the two. And within that, there's going to be benefits to either going prescriptive method of showing compliance like on a really small adu sometimes that's just easier or if you need to do trade-offs for example we've had um i had an adu that i worked on recently where we were running into troubles with uh showing compliance with some of the the windows and the window sizes. So we decided to look at a trade-off and that trade-off was bigger windows made the ADU really uh, better daylit, more aesthetically pleasing for what the architect was after. And then the trade-off was we did a hot water heat pump upgrade for the for the whole project, which included the ADU and the main house. And then that was the trade-off. Or in other cases, we've done trade-offs where we've increased the insulation 
in the attic for the whole house to help offset some of what was going on with the ADU, especially when they're addition ADUs. And ADUs, especially the brand new, uh, new construction are especially suited for all electric compliance pathway. And then keep in mind that there are some special considerations that you're going to want to um, kind of dig into the code it's for those additions and alterations that have to do with the indoor air quality. And if it's new construction, be ready for the electric ready and battery ready and uh, potential solar PVs. Karant, anything else you want to add or is there anything in chat or um do we have any folks that want to unmute and ask questions oh and maybe before we do that um sarah do you want to review the closing slide or do you want to do that in a few minutes yeah i can i can run through that really quick that way we can leave the rest of the time for questions um yeah so there are continuing education units available for both aia and icc um Feel free to email me there on my emails on the screen if you need to give us your uh, numbers. Um, the slides and the recording will be coming to your inbox soon. We also have a survey. Uh, if you could please take it, it really helps us out. And this is a, a short list of upcoming courses. There's a lot more listed on our events calendar. Um, but there's a lot of exciting uh, energy code as well as heat recovery, ventilation, um, just a, a whole slew of different course options out there. Um, so, so yeah, yeah, we can open up the rest of the time for questions. Yeah, and I can uh, click back to any uh, slide if someone, uh, if there was something specific. Yeah, please, any, anyone else with questions, send it in. I I've been holding on to one from earlier that Tim sent in that was um, kind of a unique example. Um, I thought we could try to answer. He asked um, if we could convert an existing master bedroom that is the only room on the second floor to an ADU that is above a garage. He's noting that the ADU conversion would be located greater than the maximum 16 foot height. I can't say much about that then. The remaining house is single story. Can they convert their existing master bedroom to an ADU? Not sure how energy code related that or, or driving that decision would be. Jennifer, do you have thoughts? Yeah, I, okay, if I'm understanding this right, the the master bedroom is already on top of the garage. Is that it's all it's an existing, it's just the way the house is laid out, it's already on top of the garage. It seems that way, Tim. Please chime in and clarify if this is uh if we don't have this right. It, I, that's it, what I got to, Jennifer. Yeah, and in either case, really, it's would be considered um under the additions and alteration section because it's within the walls of the existing residence. And then you would need to work with your planning and building department in the sense of, oh, is this a true ADU or a junior ADU? And then where it comes in on the energy code, and I have had this come up before, is a jurisdiction has asked us Oh, to just run a Title 24 performance compliance report just for the portion that's the ADU. That's a, and so in that case, it's an addition alone ADU because it is an addition, it's within the existing project. And then, um, then we can, if you're doing alterations and remodel as well on the main part of the house, which now becomes the new primary residence, then they asked us to do a separate report that addressed 
all the alterations of the main residence. So they ended up with two reports, even though I think technically the energy code allows you to do it all as one, this jurisdiction wanted it teased apart. And yeah, and that would be the only thing I could say that's energy related. Um, and then yeah. those ex walls are existing, the windows are existing. So if you dig into the walls, you need to fill those walls with cavity insulation. If you replace the windows, the windows have to meet the new window requirements, the new prescriptive window requirements. Great. Um, we might have a typo correction here. Back on our energy, the ESS, the energy storage system. Yeah. Uh, Richard mentioned that on the list, it shows three is the minimum uh required branch circuits when code actually says four it is four you are correct um we'll have to check our slide and make sure we have that correct yeah thank you, thank you i think okay if i only said three yeah it is four but then they only list the three that you have to have but i'll double check that slide yeah thanks um we have a question comment from cal he says he's been seeing a lot of integrated heat pump water heaters in very small closets. It's his understanding that they take up slightly more space than a conventional gas water heater. He has about 700 cubic feet or more with a six inch clearance. Yeah, Cal, they uh, they take, depending on model, of course, manufacture uh, 750 plus cubic feet of air volume to draw from. However, almost all the integrated um, heat pump manufacturers offer uh, like vent kits, direct direct exhaust vent kits. So there are ways to install them in confined spaces. It does reduce the efficiency of the units though. And the energy code accounts for that by requiring to specify where it's being installed. So you'll get, um, you know, I don't wanna say penalty credit, but you know, it, it will change your project's compliance depending on how that's installed. Yeah, one of the things on those, um, uh, one of our colleagues did install uh, a brand that is, they said it is, wasn't as quiet as they were hoping it would be. So I think that's something also just to note on those integrated ones, if you're putting in a small closet and you have a small a dwelling unit it's supposedly the most quiet ones like ream makes a very quiet one it's supposedly only as loud as your refrigerator but depends on your refrigerator like what you compare it to my refrigerator is kind of noisy so i could see where that would be a good comparison my old refrigerator was really quiet <laughs> So my new one, more noisy, um, but they're saying that they really can hear that noise. So we've had more clients um, look at installing them in a closet that's just outside the envelope and then using a uh, like air, uh, sound barrier uh, insulation to you know, something that will actually mitigate the sound and not just fiberglass bat, but something that mitigates the sound between the units and use a duct kit. So I, I think it's something to be aware of if you have a small, a uh, small house, small project. A um, little off topic, but still in the world, uh, Jenna asked about uh, San Francisco's 2022 Cal Green new construction requirements for LEED GPR. Jenna, in, in my experience, I don't know the San Francisco one specifically, but we've worked with plenty of these reach codes. Um, usually the LEED slash GPR, it, they make it so GPR is most convenient for the residential requirement and LEED often is the most convenient for the non-res. I'd have to read their specific new ordinance. So thanks for letting us know that's that's here. Um, I think we're, if we don't have any more questions, I think we're right at time. 
Can I yeah, there was a you? few people I'm going to follow up with. Um, thanks everyone for your questions during the presentation. That was that was really helpful. Can I ask a question, please? Sure, Red. Great. Uh, I'm wondering how does the Energy Code deal with a uh, new constructed detached guest quarters? Yeah, Red, we've uh, we've sent in our, our understanding and our, our interpretation of your question on a number of presentations now. So uh, just refer back to what we provided you last time because our, our interpretation hasn't changed. I believe there's another participant that has the same question. So if you could please answer the question here, we I know would appreciate it. Uh, I, I think it, it usually we just point back to the jurisdiction for the most part, uh, as Jenna mentioned, that Humboldt has their own way of handling it, which, you know, to me is unorthodox. But I know that's common with these unique, uh, unique uh, alterations. So is it true then that the energy code has no um, parameters set forth for such entity? In other words, how do we comply with the Title 24 reports when there's no option for a guest quarters which would not have a kitchen? Um, I, I believe I I'd have to pull up what I said to you last time. But code. That's why I'm asking you guys. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. Um, I believe that I said last time that what you described would depend on how the jurisdiction is uh, relating it to the adjacent ADU because you're trying to attach this uh, guest quarters that are detached to a new construction ADU as well. So by energy code, they would see that as part of the ADU. Uh, since it's detached from the home, if there was no ADU, it could be seen as an addition to the home potentially. Um, but you, you have multi, it kind of also depends on uh, what your scope of permit, how many permit applications you have. Um, uh, I think we All lost right. them. Thanks, thanks, everyone. We're just a couple minutes over, <laughs> so thanks for sticking with us. And thanks again for joining us today. Uh, we'll be sending out the recording and slides. Um, and yeah, have a great rest of your day. Thanks all. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone.